day to day practice very often and uh, many times we are not in a position to exactly decide what to do, when, when to do cross linking, whether cross linking will be useful at this stage or not, which method should be used, uh, what to do in thin corneas, when to do keratoplasties and, 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 and also there are some other issues related to you know cataract surgery in uh, keratoconus, so many things. So we thought that uh, we will have a, a presentation as well as discussion and we would like to have your opinion as well. Regard, I mean, everyone, we all should learn from each other's experience. So that's the basic idea. And uh, uh, do we have the list with us? Can we have the list, today's list please? Abhi, this session's list. Anyways, uh, I don't need the list. Uh, we have with us uh, Colonel Vijay Sharma. Uh, he is the uh, head of the department of ophthalmology in Armed Forces Medical College. Uh, we have with us Dr. Namrata Sharma, professor at RP Center Ames and needs no introduction. Myself, I'm Dr. Rajesh Sinha. I'm working as professor at RP Center Ames. Uh, we also have with us Dr. Swapna Nair, who may be joining very shortly, maybe uh, you know, moving from one hall to the other. And uh, Dr. Amit Gupta will be joining shortly. So, uh, we uh, begin with the first talk and uh, the moment the case of Kratagonas comes to us, the first thing that we start thinking is that whether we should do cross-linking or not. So, should all cases of Kratagonas be cross-linked? That's a big question. And let's have the answer from Colonel Vijay Sharma. Thank you, sir. So, good afternoon, everyone. Before uh, proceeding on to case-based uh, approach, uh, some uh, historic perspective about the collagen cross-linking. Uh, it was Wallace Walk et al. in 2003 when they first time described the collagen cross-linking at the Technical University of Dresden and hence it came to know to be known as a Dresden Protocol. So what happens in this is uh, the cornea is saturated with a riboflavin dye and uh, after the saturation of cornea it is exposed to UVA radiation uh, for some duration that increases the uh, collagen cross-linking between the axis and collagen fibrils and this results in strengthening the corneal tissue and also it stops the further progression of corneal ectasias. Now over a period of time the indications for uh, collagen cross-linking has expanded significantly. The indications are for ectasias as well as non-ectatic disorders. In ectasias, the primary ectasia such as cradoconus and pedicid marginal degeneration and in secondary uh, ectasia such as post ectasia, ectasias, the collagen cross-linking has been done. For non-ectatic disorders, it has been tried in infectious keratitis, in chemical injuries, in bullous keratopathies, in period marginal degeneration. But uh, in this, we will be covering predominantly about keratoconus. Now, uh, in keratoconus, if corneal thickness is more than 400 micron, in those cases, we proceed ahead with the isoosmolar collagen cross-linking. If the corneal thickness is less than 400, uh, but more than 330 micron, in those cases, we proceed ahead with hypoosmolar collagen cross-linking. Uh, many a times, the collagen cross-linking can be combined with a PRK, uh, that is known as topoguided removal of epithelium in keratoconus or known as TREC. It can be combined with a PTK where it is known as a cradle protocol. It can, uh, it can also be combined with the intraconeal ring segments and also there, uh, the photo activated intrastromal cross-linking can be done in cases of uh, as a customized cross-linking technique. Uh, so uh, what are the main fa parameters or factors that we consider? Corner thickness I have just explained. Uh, similarly the age. Age is one very important factor because in adults ideally we need to document the progression of keratoconus uh, uh, and if we document the progression then we should go ahead with the collagen cross linking. In children uh, the progression, uh, documentation of progression is not required because in children the uh, Progression is very fast and earlier we go for a collagen cross-linking, the results are better. And, but uh, still there are a uh, higher risk of collagen cross-linking failure in children. In very young children we should also consider the possibilities of uh, general anesthesia. And a uh, frequent follow-up should be done in children because of more chances of uh, CXL failure. Uh, the third factor, 
in addition to coil thickness and age is the keratoconus progression. Now, how do we determine the keratoconus progression? There are various factors which have been considered. If we uh, see the Dressen protocol, in uh, Dressen protocol we have taken as increase in K-max value by more than one diopter, patient self-reported deterioration of visual apathy and need for new contact lens fitting more than once in two years. These were the criteria that were taken in the Dressen protocol. Uh, Hirsch et al. in 2011, uh, they considered progression as increase in uh, more than one diopter of this DK, increase of more than one diopter in the manifest cylinder, or increase uh, of 0.5 diopter in manifest spherical, uh, reflective spherical equivalent. But Holmes and all in 2015, by this time the uh, types of uh, Scheinfeld devices had expanded significantly. Uh, and also the factors, the parameters that are in the different uh, devices, they are different for a uh, particular device. So uh, what they said that there should be consistent change in at least two of the parameters. That is progressive steepening of the interior corneal surface, progressive steepening of the posterior corneal surface and also the progressive thinning as we go from the centre towards the periphery. So any two parameters out of these three parameters, then we should consider it as a, uh, that the progression has taken place. They also said that if there is a perceived risk of progression, then uh, also the collagen cross-linking can be done without any need for documentation. So uh, various protocols are there, whether it's a conventional, accelerated or antiphoresis. Although these will be covered in detail by uh, Dr. Namata. Uh, if we see the standard versus accelerated protocol, so various studies have been done. But still, uh, the standard protocol or the conventional protocol has been found to be more efficacious compared to accelerated. In accelerated protocols, whether it's a 9 milliwatt per, uh, per centimeter square, 18 milliwatt per centimeter square for 5 minutes, or 30 milliwatt per centimeter square for 3 minutes, out of these, the 9 milliwatt per centimeter square for 10 minutes has been found to be more efficacious compared to the other two. So similarly, uh, does uh, supplemental oxygen has a role? This will be covered by Dr. Rajesh Sinhal sir. And also there are uh, two other types. One is the continuous accelerated collagen cross-linking and another is the pulse accelerated cross-linking. In pulse accelerated cross-linking, there is pulsing of the UV radiation is done so that there is sufficient time in the cornea to get oxygenation and they are found to be more efficacious compared to a continuous accelerated collagen cross-linking. Antiphoresis, uh, I don't have any first-hand experience. There are very, very few people, I think, in the world or in India doing it. Uh, but uh, here the epithelium is not removed, but it is much more efficacious compared to epion approach because two electrodes are placed in the ribocleric penetration into stroma is good without removal of the epithelium and then the UV exposure results in a uh, better uh, uh, efficacy compared to epion approach. But still it was found to be inferior to standard Dresden protocol. Uh, some contraindication that you need to be uh, need to keep in uh, mind whenever you are doing uh, collagen cross linking. If there is a prior herpetic ocular infection, in these cases one has to be careful because UV radiation can cause reactivation of the infection. If there is a concurrent ocular infection, that has to be treated first before uh, going ahead with the collagen cross linking. Neurotrophic keratitis, poor epithelial bone healing, and the dry eyes. These should be. Uh, first, the ocular surface should be optimized before going ahead with the collagen cross-linking. Similarly, in pregnancy, one has to be careful and wait uh, uh, for an opportune time uh, for collagen cross-linking. Uh, in uh, many cases, there are very high chances of failure of primary collagen cross-linking. So, uh, what are the risk factors for failure of primary CXL? These are the children, especially if they have allergic conjunctivitis, uh, in uh, history of eye rubbing, uh, female gender, pre-op K-max value of more than 58 and paracentral bone. So they have been found to have higher uh, failure rates compared to normal and in these cases the repeat CXL is required. So let's see few cases. In one eye you can see there is a corneal hydrops, in other eye is keratoconus. So if we see uh, the uh, values in this, uh, the thinnest pecky in the left eye is 399 and in the right eye is not reportable due to hydrops. So what should you do? You, you should not wait uh, for any documentation in such cases. You can straight, eye, straight away go ahead with the collagen cross-linking in the left eye. Otherwise it will go, it, it may have the same uh, feature of corneal hydrops. 
similarly, uh, this is another case, if the quantum thickness has gone down to the say, 355, so in these cases also you should not wait for uh, collagen cross-linking. But if the quantum thickness is good, parameters are not very high, like in this case, in one eye is 515, other is 506, Kmax value are 49 and 49 by 9. So in these cases, you can still wait till you document all the uh, changes and uh, then go ahead. This is another case. In this the right eye, uh, the quantum thickness is 428, Kmax value is 76. In the left eye, the quantum thickness is 376 and Kmax value is 71. So in this case, also you should go ahead with the collagen cross link in the left eye, followed by maybe after 2-3 months in the right eye. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you Dr. Vijay for uh, covering it very well. The only question that is always asked, often asked and, and people keep thinking that uh, when should we wait for progression and when not. So as he told that somebody who has already had a high drops, then in that case there is no point waiting. Even on first contact one can go ahead and do a cross thinking. Sometimes uh, it also depends on the age of the patient. Like somebody who is say coming with an uh, advancing keratoconus, something like thickness of 435 at the age of 17 or 18, then uh, you would like to do cross-linking immediately. But somebody who is at the age of 31 coming with 440 and uh, then you may think that let's see, uh, you know, maybe we can wait every three months we can call the patient. So these factors are there. Any, any other situations wherein, you know, you would like to highlight? that uh, we should do immediately uh, or we can wait. I mean, age, I feel, is an important factor. Further, uh, I mean, even if you don't have any documentation, on first report of a patient, because that is that is something which wherein people do have doubt, that patient is coming for the first time. There's no documentation of any progression, whether I should do cross-linking or not. That is a big question. Yeah, so in, in the same vein, would you wait um, for, uh, would you do an immediate uh, cross-linking if there is loss of lines uh, in the first visit itself? So I felt that was also an important criteria, especially in a young patient. Absolutely, absolutely ma'am. Very, very important. And uh, uh, another thing, before you decide based on a Delta uh, or any Shamflak image report, you have to uh, ensure that that Shamflak image is, uh, the acquisition quality is good. Sometimes what happens, the acquisition quality is not good, then you get very, very different parameters and in those cases, if you take a call on that, it will be, uh, it may not be a correct treatment. So acquisition quality of the image on which you are deciding the treatment has to be good so that you take a correct decision. And in the same vein, when would you repeat, uh, what is the criteria for you to repeat uh, CXL uh, in a patient? So, uh, especially in children, uh, one is we have to follow up frequently. Uh, if they have got allergic disorders or uh, uh, any eye rubbing history, they are likely to uh, have a failure of the primary CXL. So in these cases, the repeat criteria is normally, if there is an increase of Kmax value by more than one diopter, increase of uh, cylinder by more than one diopter, and spherical equivalent by more than 0.5 diopter. That is what we are considering at present for uh, repeat CXL. So is that only for children or for adults as well? Adults also, adults. Uh, uh, there is uh, one group that has also suggested that you know uh, if there is some effect, then in order to have an additive effect like Farhad and Izzy group, they do repeat CXL even early, like you know even uh, three four months later when they uh, see that there is some effect. If the patient does not show any effect at all, then in that case there is no point repeating because these are some of the outliers which are not going to be affected by cross link. And there are some cases which do show some response for, for you know, st stoppage of progression for maybe a couple of years, and then again they started. Then again, there also is a, that is also an indication wherein uh, we should repeat uh, processing. Especially after pregnancy, probably. And yes, assuming. and post pregnancy, one should definitely keep checking during the pregnancy whether it is changing or not. And if it's changing, we should wait for the delivery of the child and preferably post lactation period so that by that time things stabilize and then again we can uh, go ahead and do it.
in children normally we recommend that every three months we should do the uh, repeat shine plan. In adults, ma'am, uh, six months is I think good enough time. Any any change? Any any difference? Yeah, I, I think yeah, that that's the same yeah, criteria. I, yes, in, in initial follow up period, yes, for other reasons also because sometimes in cross linking you do get some subepithelial haze. So in initial period you do have to follow up these patients more frequently to look for the haze. If there is haze, then you have to increase the topical steroid frequency. That is one. And uh, if that is not there, then in that case, after initial, uh, you know, follow-up, epithelial healing, and you know, uh, then every three months, and then later on six months, and uh, and if it's stable, then uh, maybe yearly you can follow up the patient. So it it uh, you know depends on how the patient is responding and uh, and duration of the CX that has. I I'll, I'll also give a frequent follow-up to a person who is an eye rubber. So usually by three months, we get to know whether they want to continue eye rubbing in spite of all that has happened to them. So in that case also. And, and that is something which we have to explain that eye rubbers or people who are having these VKCs, the response of CXL in these patients is not good. So the first thing is that if a case of VKC comes to, to us, then we have to first treat VKC to the extent that this child stops rubbing the eye or it is minimal. And then only uh, we can think of doing a crossing. Otherwise, mm -hmm. the effect of crossing will not be good at all. And secondly, apart from the less effect of crossing, the risk of subepithelial haze is also high in these cases where it there is a case. Uh, Colonel Vijay Sharma, uh, you know, when he started his presentation, the first statement he made was that if the cornea is more than 400 microns, we can safely do crosslinking to have a stabilization of keratoconus as well as some degree of flattening of uh, the keratometry. But if the cornea is thin, then then what to do? Because CXL is safe only if it's more than 400 microns as the standard teaching. I'll come to some other thing that is coming up, but this is the standard teaching which we are still following. And if it is less than 400 microns, what happens that uh, the UV rays, which is focused onto the surface of the cornea, it hits the endothelium and causes endothelial damage. And there can be a variable degree of endothelial damage because of that. And so that the, the, the reason why we keep thinking about how, what to do CXL in thin cornea is to increase the gap of the focus of UV rays on the surface to the endothelium. So if it's more than 400 microns by any means then it is safe. That is the basic idea. And that is why the first thing that, you know, for how the basic group they started doing was hypoosmolar riboflavin. So they used 0.1% uh, riboflavin in 0.9% saline and that helped to swell the cornea. This is what uh, they, they did. Because of this, the cornea uh, uh, increased in thickness and by increasing the thickness of the cornea, the safety to endothelium increased. But there is a question, uh, the, the, the effect is not as much as conventional processing because there is a paradox. You are increasing the intercellular spaces and you are again compacting it. So these are two different things and that is why the result may not be as great but still it does have some effect and there is no harm in doing it and it is still established modality. Then. Uh, People have also used contact lens assisted CXL. They have put contact lens and then did CXL. Now the problem with this is that if you are putting contact lens, we know that cross linking is effective only up to anterior two third of cornea. And part of it is being occupied by the contact lens, which you throw it away. So the effect will be less, number one. Number two, the pre corneal or post contact lens tear film that impedes the penetration of UV rays and that is also a reason why the effect is not as great and that is why it is not so popular. So people use smile and liquid again so that the uh, you know the pre-corneal tear film will go away because it will fall directly onto the surface. But again following the same thing that part of it you know it works only in anterior tooth and you are again throwing away the smile and liquid so the effect may not be as great. People have done trans epithelial CXL to, to keep that epithelium so that you know the thickness remains 400 microns. 
but it is not as effective. Some people have done crisscrossing of uh, you know epithelial removal, but it has been noted that you know the area where the epithelium was intact, the demarcation line was not clearly visible. So uh, we did this study wherein we uh, used uh, uh, we created a uh, femtosecond laser assisted pocket intrastomally and introduced a donor lenticule. Now this donor lenticule was created from a donor cornea and uh, it was uh, initially we used to uh, use 7 millimeter micro, uh, 7 millimeter uh, donor lenticule. Now we are using 8.5 millimeter because initially we are, we are using Bizumax with which we could create a 7.8 millimeter uh, pocket. Now we are using FS200 with which we can make 9.5 millimeter pocket, 9 millimeter pocket. So now here the femtosecond laser is being used to create the pocket and then we infuse riboflavin in the pocket. So that uh, penetrates very fast on both sides. You are, interest, you are putting it intrastromally. So it penetrates very fast. In two minutes time it penetrates on both sides and then you can put the lenticule inside. What I am doing is that I am ablating the central 4 millimeter of the stromal lenticule with excimer laser so that we create a hyperopic lenticule. We create a lenticule with lesser thickness in the center and more in the periphery so that it will have an arc shortening effect as well. So this is uh, what is done. This is the donor lenticule which is being used and this is introduced inside uh, the, uh, store, the pocket and uh, this is how it is done. It is introduced inside and once it is introduced inside is spread on all sides and then cross-linking is done. Now initially on day one of, of course the thickness will be high but with time the thickness reduces but somebody who is uh, we have done it and uh, up to uh, 330 microns and if we are putting a donor lenticule of 200 microns and centrally if we ablate 75 microns so centrally it will be 125. It reduces in thickness and at six months time it is showing about 89, 90, 95 in the center. So if somebody who is having 330 microns of cornea will have 420, 430 and you have done cross-linking as well. So you are increasing the tectonic strength as well as you are stiffening the cornea. The only problem is that you have two interfaces because you are putting a lenticule. So the, the risk of interface haze. So you have to use topical steroid for a long period and if you use topical steroid for a long period it uh, looks as clear as this is and uh, later on uh, it is not a refractive procedure number one I would just like to mention later on for best visual acuity you have to give uh, say a mini sterile contact lens but then this patient may not require a keratoplasty later and this is how it looks like some of the cases which have shown very well the the topography improves significantly the astigmatism reduces and uh, uh, all these, uh, some of these cases have shown good response. Uh, we have done two such studies, one with 7 uh, millimeter uh, lenticule, one with 8.5. Right now I am doing an ICMR project on this with 8.5 millimeter uh, lenticule and let's see how it works. Uh, another thing just I would like to mention uh, this small uh, because of paucity of time, uh, just moving forward. Uh, another thing that has come up is adaptive fluids. But how the basic group has uh, told that if the cornea is thin, use UV rays for shorter period. And they have used it like sub 400 protocol allows for treatment of cornea as thin as 214 microns. So there are a lot of questions on this, a lot of queries on this paper. The query, first query is this that they have not evaluated the specular. They have not done the endothelial <coughs> count. They have just told that there was no endothelial decompensation and that cannot be a parameter because young individuals they in those cases even if there is endothelial cell loss they have enough of endothelium that there won't be any decompensation that is one that is one lacking number two is that if accelerated cross linking of 30 milliwatt per centimeter square for three minutes was not as effective as conventional how can this conventional cross linking of three milliwatt per centimeter square for you know for uh, one minute in 214 microns is going to be effective. So there's so many queries in this. So right now it is, uh, uh, you know, these, these are some of the queries that uh, have been raised. Just uh, half a minute I'll take. Uh, a lot of uh, the people they have uh, 
you know, uh, they are talking about uh, oxygen concentration in this stroma. And uh, uh, Theo group, they did animal study and they found out that the oxygen concentration in the mid stroma goes down to zero after one minute of UV exposure. And we need singlet oxygen from cross thinking. So if there is no oxygen, how can you get singlet oxygen? So this means you need more oxygen. So put more oxygen. And this is what uh, they used oxygen uh, mask. We created a indigenous uh, uh, mask which was published in the European Journal of Ophthalmology. This is uh, one of the thesis that I have done with one of my candidates. And uh, this, uh, the, the mask of Avedro that is extremely expensive. This is, this cost uh, 3000 uh, euros for six masks and this is only, this whole PPE kit uh, will cost only 300 rupees. So that is the difference. And it can be reused, can be sterilized, reused. And it can be attached to uh, an anesthesia machine from where you can uh, uh, put uh, oxygen and you can measure the oxygen saturation also around the eye with the help of this camera. And this is the hole that has been made in the goggle and this is the cannula, IV cannula that has been introduced inside to look for the oxygen concentration and then you put riboflavin and then go ahead and do a cross thinking. This is good uh, but we thought that we are putting so much of oxygen the response should be very good but the response was not as great as we had expected. So probably there is some other factor apart from just the oxygen that is there uh, which governs the effect of cross-linking. And uh, I just wind up now that uh, you know cross-linking is an established modality. In thin corneas we are doing study with the intrastromal lenticule which is showing promise but maybe uh, after a few years we will be in a position to form a nomogram or so something. Uh, in thin corneas we have to be really careful Hypoosmolar does have effect, not as great as uh, conventional, but yes, uh, this is one modality apart from intrastromal lenticule with CXL. These are two modalities that are quite uh, commonly being used otherwise also. When we started doing it five years back, uh, at that time uh, it was not being done, but now there are many people who are presenting on these intrastromal lenticule with cross -link. Thank you very much and any suggestion and query, I'm sorry for overshooting. Hey, Dr. Rajesh, uh, regarding that oxygen which was very um, uh, nice to see, uh, so uh, how do you ensure that the intrastromal concentration, I mean, is there any form of titration yeah. for that or how yes, do you? Yes, actually uh, uh, studies, animal studies have shown that if oxygen is being supplied, uh, with the rate of 4 liter per minute, then the periocular oxygen saturation is close to 80% and intrastromal oxygen concentration increases up to uh, 37 or 38%. So we use 5 liter per, uh, per minute and the, in, uh, the, the periocular concentration was uh, average was 84, 85. And so we expected that the oxygen, I mean, we didn't do a, we didn't put a cannula in the stroma to look for that because that has been done in animal studies already. So we expected that the oxygen saturation should be about 38, 40 uh, uh, millimeter of, uh, yeah. So that will be the par partial pressure or that will be the oxygen saturation uh, concentration in the intrastromally. That is what we expected. We expected better results, but the results were not as great as we. The KMAX reduced more than in eyes wherein uh, oxygen was not used. But apart from that, the astigmatism, etc., did not reduce that much. So, I mean, we had a lot of uh, you know euphoria in the mind that we are doing this, and the result will be fantastic. It will be uh, mind blowing, but it was just very marginally above uh, the normal. So maybe there are other factors which we have to maybe study and... Uh, which guy did you do? Uh, which guy did you Which guy were you Was it an SPM? I, I, no, no, not SPM, the Dexter one. Dexter one. Yeah, yeah. We yeah. did a similar study. Yeah. As you have concluded, it doesn't appear to be doing any big purpose. Yeah. yeah. Smile and then do no no no. No, okay, you're talking about my study, the 
interest of one. This is, these are not spinal tissues. These are created from donor tissue. Because for 200 microns of uh, you know spinal endicule you require uh, you will have very few patients wherein you will get damage of thickness. So we create it from a donor tissue and then ablate the central part to create a hyperopic lenticule so that uh, hoping for an arc shortening effect because the periphery bit is thick and the center is thin there will be some arc shortening effect. So that is what uh, we aim for. It's something like a bio ICR. Yeah, uh, that is true. There are many things. People are using cares. People are using. Uh, you'll be talking about the ring segments. So uh, the idea was that only that it will have some effect of a ring segment with some increase in thickness in the center as well. So keeping both the things in mind, this was. Yeah. And regarding the oxygen part, I, I have a belief. It's not proven or it's just a hunch that uh, there must be a particular level beyond which oxygen is of no use even if supplemented. Maybe that's why you don't see great results when you provide oxygen and those who don't have also. Yeah, that's very true. That, so the idea is this, that singlet oxygen is causing covalent bond. So if you increase the singlet oxygen, there will be more covalent bond. But that is not true. That is not true. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Thank you for generating a lot of interest in this topic. Now the next talk is by uh, Dr. Sopna Nair. She will be discussing how does the intracorneal ring segments they help, when to do, what are the types and what are the indications and in which cases it, they have to be used. To Dr. Sopna Nair. Thank you, Dr. Jay. Uh, so uh, we all know that myopic correction has two methods. Either you take off tissue from the center or you add tissue to the pet. Now here we will be talking about uh, ICRS, not only as a means of refractive correction, but also as a means of product, uh, pro producing mechanical support to a thin and weak cornea. So uh, we know that the posterior stroma is less compact than the anterior. Now that is where the ICRS goes in. And for uh, every di uh, the diameter of the ring, it is inversely proportional to the dietary correction uh, you can achieve. And at the same time, the thickness of the ring is directly proportional. So if you want to have more of a refractive correction, you keep the ring closer to the center of the cornea. And if you want to have a more of a, a refractive correction, you use a thicker ring. So these are the principles on which all intracornea ring segments are based. So earlier they used to have 360 degree rings which they found were very uh, prone to complications because of which they divided into two segments and that can be customized depending on the shape of the cornea and the uh, extent of catabonus or the extent of refract irregular refraction the patient has. So the mechanisms by which the segments act, all of them are by creating space between corneal lamellae. So they act as spacers. They shorten the central arc length. So there is a cone length and magnitude index which is a product of the anterior uh, corneal mapping this term has come from older instruments like uh, you know the Keratron and the TMS that used to map only the anterior surface. So the arc length of the cornea between the rings is shortened and thereby myopia is reduced. Then uh, some people, have the, the change of the disease course, the biomechanical effect has been variable in you know depending on various studies. But there are studies that have proven that the stress in the cornea is definitely decreased. And also it decreases the higher order abrasions, especially the comma and the comma-like abrasions that are produced uh, because of the irregular cornea in keratobones. Now uh, it's indicated in multiple corneal conditions, uh, the most common of which is keratobonus. I've used it post-PK and post-lasic ectasia as well. Now when do you use it? When you have loss of lines due to corneal changes, when you have a high corneal uh, dietric uh, value, when there is a central clear cornea and at least 450 microns of cornea at the region where you need to pass the uh, ring. So this is not a value for the central corneal thickness but of the region where the mid periphery of the cornea. And these are the multiple indications where you shall not use uh, the ICRS. Uh, especially when they are corneal scars or uh, uh, low endothelial counts uh, uh, and aggressive eye rubber. And you have to use in caution in patients with large pupils and low endothelial counts like I mentioned before. 
So these are the multiple type of rings. So uh, intax is one of the most commonly used ones. So the arc in intax is 150 degrees, hexagonal in cross section and it has an inner diameter of 6.7 and outer of 8.1. You have uh, those that are used for steeper corneas or for higher uh, amount of keratoconus when you have uh, inner diameters lesser than the previously mentioned ring. So you are getting closer to the center to correct more of um, uh, refractive error. And the thickness is 0 0.21 to 0 0.5 millimeters in steps. The Ferrera uh, is another um, uh, company which manufactures the rings and you have uh, um, triangular rings in this case. So does the Kera ring also look the same? triangular except that it has two more arcs compared to uh, Ferrara rings uh, which are 90 to 1, 210 whereas Ferra, uh, Ferrara has like uh, Kera rings are available in slightly larger arc lengths and optic zones corrected are nearly the same they are uh, uh, slightly farther away from the cornea compared to the uh, previous rings I mentioned being triangular in cross sections the height of the triangle that determines the thickness of the ring now this is a Mayo ring which is a 360 degree ring, uh, it's a continuous uh, ring and uh, it has a convex outer surface, upper surface and a flat lower surface. So and it is inserted into a pocket created. So now this is a man, so you can uh, make your uh, incision either manually using a uh, spiral keto or you can have a femto dissection which is what is commonly practiced where you need to create only channels depending on how many rings you want to place. So uh, this is how uh, a manual keratome works and this has been used for a Ferrara ring segment. So here uh, you can see how a continuous channel is being created and that uh, is the one through which you place both the segments depending on whether you are treating an asymmetric cornea or a symmetric core. Now you can note that in, in, in these ring segments basically channels that are created which are tightly bound by the cornea whereas when you are using a 360 degree ring you need to create a pocket and therefore the, uh, uh, the chances of the ring not staying in its proper position and changing and extruding are much much more. Now this is how a Mayo ring is inserted into a a pocket that has been created by the femtosecond laser. There is a small cut over there through which the ring can be passed inside. It is passed and centered on the pupil. All these rings are centered on the pupil. So to mark the pupillary center before the procedure is absolutely important. Now uh, this is the femto incision for uh, the intacts. You can note that the uh, before passing the femtosecond laser, the center of the cornea is marked followed by the, the laser can be programmed for uh, passing uh, the uh, intact rings and it creates two channels and one main square shaped area pocket which is the area where the incision is made and what I would like you to note is that this pocket is created the incision part is where the steepest part of the cornea is and then you have either sides on which the ring moves. So the femtosecond incision just takes all of maybe 2 to 5 seconds to create and as you can see it's so much less cumbersome compared to the previous uh, the manual keratome that's been used. And as you can see so these are the pockets that are created and then you move on the ring into the channels that have been created followed by an incision after the passing of the second ring. Now uh, how do you choose what ring to pass, the company helps you, whichever uh, one you are choosing and depending on whether your cone is central, whether it's symmetric, you decide how to go about it. So if you have a very central cone uh, which is purely myopic or has very low astigmatic components, you do choose symmetric rings. So you can see that here you have chosen 0.45 uh, uh, thickness rings and uh, on either side is the same and you can see it's along the steep axis that the incision is there, 90 degree. Uh, namely, uh, on the other side when you have higher astigmatic components then you may choose asymmetric rings. You can have a thinner ring uh, on the upper part and a thicker ring in the lower part. For highly oval cones you can even have a single inferior ring segments like you have seen over there. 
So mid peripheral pachy is what is important. If you see the two maps, you can see that the pachymetry is much lower in the map on the right, 315 microns, whereas it's higher in the uh, uh, left map, but it is the central pachy. And we are not concerned about the central pachy. We uh, are more concerned about the pachymetry in the mid periphery, which you can see is much better in the thinner cornea over there. So that is a suitable candidate, the other one is not. The topographic and the visual outcomes are excellent. And uh, you can see how much the dioptric power changes in an individual and how much the cornea, the irregular astigmatism becomes more regular and more amenable to correction with optical devices. So this is how uh, the eye looks following the procedure. Now it can be combined by various modalities. We've already talked about CHL. It can be combined with ICLs following intacts. And intax with excimer is also known. But one of the best methods is to combine it with CXL. Now, uh, there is mechanical and refractive correction by intax because the end points of the intax you see over there provide a traction in the direction of the steep corner so that it results in flattening. Then, uh, it, the, by, by its biomechanical action, CXL on top of this would cause strengthening of the cornea. So the sequence preferred is that you insert the index first followed by the CXL. Though there has been a lot of debate on that at uh, multiple places, but uh, the factors that favor the insertion of the index first is that the dissection is easier and this is followed by a bonded cornea at the end of the procedure. Whereas on the other hand, if you are inserting index into a bonded cornea, then you are weakening a cornea that you have already tried to make strong. Complications are multiple, uh, but not very frequent. Superficial protrusion or AC perforation, then infection. Uh, so there's a lot of literature on that. I'd just like to highlight a few things. Now there are some innocuous white deposits that you see over here. So they're basically fatty acids. They don't do anything morphologically to the cornea or to the ring or to the vision. So uh, they can be left alone. They're commonly seen. Then ring extrusion is uh, not a good thing. That's you, that usually happens when you haven't gone into 75 to 80 percent of the depth of the cornea. You can see on fluorescent staining that it is in, uh, 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 in connection with uh, the external environment. Neovascularization has been reported uh, because you have created a channel and there is a potential space over there. Now, uh, the histopathology of the cornea has been studied by a group and they have found that it's usually at the inner edge of the ring that most of the pathological changes happen. You can see that is where uh, the cells gather, the macrophages gather and uh, you have slight attenuation of the corneal endothelial cells as well. Now, the longest follow-up, follow this is my last slide, slide. So, the longest follow-up has been very recently published uh, in February. And they have followed the patients up to 12 years. So up to 5 years they have found that uh, all patients have had a gain in visual acuity, refraction and uh, topography. And up to 5 years everyone has been doing that. But those they had got to follow up for 12 years, they found that a majority of patients are coming back to baseline following intacts if not done with a supportive procedure like cross linking. So it greatly changes the quality of life in a patient is better uh, when treated with CXL and it's always reversible. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Swapna. It was an excellent presentation. I just have one query. Uh, meanwhile, uh, I'll invite Professor Namita Sharma for her talk on types of riboflavin and uh, current status of accelerated cross thinking. I just have one query that, you know, you showed about the Ferrara ring and um, some other rings. Uh, I personally don't have experience of Ferrara ring. Uh, I'm a little hesitant in using it because it is put at 4 millimeter zone and I use uh, Intax uh, more often because it is more peripheral. So do these patients have any problem uh, during evening time or dim illumination or anything? So yeah, that's why the pupil size is very important which we get when we do the topography. So very large pupils, very lightly pigmented, it's better to avoid or at least tell them this is what they're getting in exchange. Uh, but otherwise, uh, for most Indian eyes, that is not a very big question, especially with intacts, like you said, which goes into a wider zone. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have Professor Namita Sharma, Chairperson Scientific Committee of AIS, with a talk on types of viral and current status of accelerated cross-linking.
Thank you, Rajesh. I would like to thank Dr. Rajesh for making me a part of this uh, very important course, which he's been doing for many years. And I'm going to be talking about types of riboflavin in current status of accelerated cross-linking. Now, uh, I'm sure all this has already been uh, talked about, so I will just uh, skip this. And basically, the riboflavin uh, is a photo-activated chromophore with the absorption peak at 370 nanometers. It's a large hydrophilic molecule and uh, it does require corneal deepithelization, so it is non-toxic, it is photosensitizer and uh, of course the barrier uh, has to be broken in the form of deepithelization. A lot of research is being going on uh, for this to find out alternatives of riboflavin, but I think un as of now uh, there are no substitutes, uh, although the research is there. So, uh, the mechanism of collagen cross-linking is known to all of us and there is increased UVA absorption of the cornea which causes the formation of the new covalent bonds uh, in the presence of the riboflavin and the UV radiation uh, which causes the induction of the collagen cross-links. So, if you see the US FDA approved solutions, there are two of them that is riboflavin 5-phosphate and 20% extra solution uh, and the riboflavin 5-phosphate uh, of thermic uh, solution which is mainly for less than 400 microns of the cornea thickness. Uh, this is uh, what is generally available. Uh, riboflavin print extrans, hypoosmolaric riboflavin, uh, riboflavin which has been made for transepithelial uh, collision cross-linking, riboflavin with HPMC and riboflavin for intrastomal application in combination with classic. Out of this, only uh, riboflavin, a bit extra, and the hypo uh, hypo riboflavin are the ones which are FDA uh, approved. Uh, basically, it is important to understand that the dextran based riboflavin solutions do have a spotic effect of dextran, which reduces the corneal thickness, and the HPMC based uh, can be <coughs> HPMC based are the ones which will not reduce the corneal thickness, and there's a few increased causes increased diffusion rate and reduced loading time. Uh, this is a study which looked at dextran versus HPMC based solution difference in the clinical outcomes and transient thinning of the cornea was noted due to 20% dextran which results in a significantly greater depth of post-operative cornea treatment with UV light once the dextran thin cornea returns to its uh, pre-operative thickness. And this is just to show two examples from Peshke. Of course, I do not have any uh, financial interest in any of uh, this, the isotonic and the hypotonic solution. Uh, uh, generally, uh, the, these uh, solutions are now uh, commercially available and the isoosmolar is the one which is 0.1% prepared by diluting vitamin B2 with 20% uh, dextran and hypoosmolar is the one which is dextran free prepared by 0.5% riboflavin with physiological salt solution the 0.1% uh, concentration. Now for transepithelial uh, 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 collagen cross-linking also uh, standard uh, formulations have minimal penetration uh, through the intact corneal epithelium. So there are methods to increase the transepithelial riboflavin permeability which can be done by benzyl corneum or EDTA or vitamin E CPGS or even by iontophoresis. Of course uh, the iontophoresis is not a very practical uh, solution for this because it may not be available. People have also used oral riboflavin in the dose of 400 milligrams. Oral administration is accompanied by 15 minutes sunlight exposure and data on ocular bioavailability and dose response relationship of the systemically absorbed rib riboflavin is limited and coupled with that it can cause side effects like increased risk of sunburn and photo aging of the skin. So uh, Dresden versus uh, accelerated protocol uh, uh, is which is as shown and the basic idea is that the total energy which is there should be 90, where it is 3 uh, milliwatt per centimeter square for 30 minutes, or it is uh, 6 into 15 or 9 into 10 or 15 into 6 uh, as per the uh, accelerated protocol. Uh, the need for rapid protocols is mainly because uh, the patient, for the patient uh, comfort and also in certain groups of patients such as children, it may not be possible for children to cooperate for a prolonged uh, period of time. Now, uh, there are various studies which have compared standard versus accelerated cross-linking and there is a di difference in the demarcation line. This was a retrospective uh, study 
uh, which looked at it and demarcation line was more superficial with accelerated protein cross-linking as compared to with standard cross-linking. And this was a meta-analysis of more than 1000 plus eyes uh, and uh, they concluded that consideration of the less content thinning favors the accelerated cross-linking whereas the deeper demarcation line and greater changes in the minimum keratometric values in collagen cross-linking may indicate a higher treatment efficacy. So, uh, conventional cross-linking as well as accelerated cross-linking provides successful results as far as the strengthening of the content tissue is concerned. Again, AP of uh, standard and AP of accelerated cross-linking, five-year results showed that there was no difference in terms of mean depth of condensed stromal demarcation line and there were similar visual and topographic outcomes at five-year follow-up. I think in all these uh, cases, it is important to have a long-term follow-up studies because we know that the collagen uh, turnover rate is seven to eight years. Now, this was accelerated collagen cross-linking in pediatric eyes and again it showed stable keratometry and corner thickness till 36 months of uh, follow-up. Accelerated cross-linking can be pulsed or continuous normal fluence versus high fluence. It could be pachymetry based uh, which has become the norm now and you can also have photorefractive intrastromal cross-linking as well as the LASIK extra. As far as the high influence, high fluence accelerated cross-linking is concerned, there are minimal changes in the thinness pre-op areas but thinning introduces the thickness variability in the central 6 millimeters and there are uh, thinning is there in the infronasal area. So if you look at this study which did high fluence accelerated cross-linking, it did show that there is epithelial remodeling after 6 months and improved regularity across central 6 millimeter zone which is its function. Now this again looked at pulsed versus continuous uh, light accelerated cross-linking with better outcomes in addition to deeper demarcation line which is noted in those eyes which receive the pulse cross-linking. Uh, this is uh, just to show the same and also the confocal pictures of the same. Uh, Again, when the confocal pictures were looked at, it was found that there was deeper apoptosis in the demarcation line uh, compared to the uh, 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 conventional uh, accelerated cross-linking in the pulsed, continuous like uh, accelerated cross-linking in the pulsed uh, uh, accelerated cross-linking. Uh, this is based on the N nomogram which allows for selection of the treatment protocol to achieve the desired cross-linking depth because that may need to vary depending upon the pachymetry and uh, this is of course for intrastromal cross-linking where you have a different kind of uh, riboflavin which has to be used. Uh, LASIK extra of course has been done with variable results uh, and uh, uh, I know that some people do claim with, that the results are very good but I think you require a huge sample size and a very long follow-up to say whether uh, you are actually uh, preventing uh, uh, corneal ectasia after doing LASIK or not. And these are the various clinical studies, all of which say that flattening uh, does occur in these cases. And there are concerns with accelerated uh, cross-linking which are there. I'm sure uh, this has been discussed, the oxygen, uh, whether it is useful in cross-linking or not. So I think uh, limitations are there in the current literature and there is variability in terms of progression criteria, grading methods, riboflavin solutions and the soaking time as well as UV radiation and the follow-up period. And uh, to conclude, accelerated cross-linking safely allows corneal stiffening in cases of progressive keratoconus. There are variable results reported in different studies and the effects have shown to be nearly similar to the standard cross-linking uh, but short and mid-term results are only available and we really need to look at the uh, long-term results uh, of the same. Uh, in a longer uh, group, in a larger group of patients and particularly the high risk groups such as young children, syndromic associations which need to be se evaluated separately from the general population. So thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you Dr. Namita for a very nice overview, a complete overview I would say on Radoflevin and uh, all these uh, newer modalities. Uh, one thing you mentioned, uh, uh, meanwhile I just invite Dr. Amit Gupta, Dr. Amit Gupta for his talk on uh, IR power calculation in eyes with keratoconus, which again is a big issue. Cataract and keratoconus, what will you do? How will you calculate the IR power? That's an important issue. One thing I wanted to know from you that there, there was a couple of reports about oral Radoflevin being given and uh, how
how do how much do you think is the practicality of such a thing in uh, particularly in a country like india i i know that there are studies which have been done yeah. but personally i would not have any experience i don't i don't think it's a viable issue or a, i mean it's a feasible uh, proposition although you know for the research purposes or for otherwise I mean, just to see whether it works or not okay Madam, I have a question for you. Uh, we keep talking about the demarcation line, and uh, it's very really doesn't. No, I, I can answer it now. Only it really doesn't have any value. <laughs> Also, the exit length. Many of these keratoconus patients are myo, 
and uh, that also leads to the challenge of the biometry in these patients. So what happens to the K readings? Their K readings become steeper in keratoconus, the coronal power will be more and therefore the biometry will assume that this high coronal power applies to the whole of the cornea. It will overestimate the coronal power and lead to a hyperopic shift in these patients uh, at the end. Uh, so this is one of the publications. I'm just summing, summing it up for you. What they concluded was that in mild to moderate keratoconus, the cat results of cataract surgery are much, much better. But once we reach advanced keratoconus, there is a huge tendency to have a hyperopic result. And what they did, what they recommended is they used the total corneal refractive power. And when they used that, they noted that there was a very slight myopic shift which occurred after surgery. So that is what they, they recommended that, okay, we can use a total corneal refractive power. Another study in advanced keratoconus patients, what they said is that instead of uh, using the K power which comes through either biometry or pentacam, they said we should apply a standardized K reading of 43.25 characters. And in this uh, study of uh, about 92 eyes, they found that that hyperopic shift didn't occur and they had uh, uh, results which are very reasonable in advanced keratoconus, only in advanced keratoconus. Another study by Watson also suggested using the standard K values. We can discuss later on how many of us would like to use standard K values for severe keratoconus, but for actual values should be used in mild to moderate keratoconus. The role of pentacam is, is uh, uh, very critical in planning these patients, especially the maps like an equivalent K reading map. So it, uh, it can help us to overcome the problem of that off-centered corneal apex. And we can choose the centration apex versus people. And uh, equivalent K reading map I think is very reliable because it focuses on the center of the cornea, balances the irregularities of the cornea, and uh, therefore it can give rise to a more accurate reading. So this is an example of a EKR report and we can, we can see the distribution of the keratometric values. We can also change the, the diameter of the mean K values or the EKR 65 and then reach a conclusion which kind of K reading we want to use. Now which formula to use? There is a huge variety of call, uh, formulas that are available with us and uh, you know there are multiple studies. SRKT has come out to be the winner in almost each and every one of these uh, studies that SRKT T formula gives uh, the most accurate, it need, need not be the most accurate for the atomos, but it, out of all the formulas, it was the most accurate. And also, that another study which showed that the SRKT uh, formula was very, uh, was most accurate. But now, we talk about the GAIN formula. So, in this is the initial publication by GAIN, where they showed that this was more accurate than the SRKT and SRKT was the most accurate formula out of the traditional formulas that were used. How do you access the gain formula? It is available on iorformula.com and this uses the modified coronal power derived from anterior coronal radii of curvature and represents the true anterior posterior ratio in keratoconic eyes while minimizing the effect of coronal power on effective lens position. So this is this is a, a correction which is so gain formula and gain keratoconus formula is available there at that site and you can use. So it uses axial length, keratometry, anterior chamber depth, lens thickness, central corneal thickness and optionally the gender of the patient. What Cain did was he divided the patients according to keratoconus. Now we know that many of the keratoconus patients are more severe but for him a stage 3 was more than 53 diapers. I think maybe we have to alter uh, that according to our own experience. But what he did was he added a corrective factor. So for stage 1 no adjustment, for stage 2 0.75 to minus 1 and up to minus 2 to minus 3 degrees of uh, corrective factors, uh, the, the, the predicted refraction you feed into when you decide the IOL power. And he showed that uh, although the results of SRKT were also very good, but the, the percentage of eyes which were more uh, than two adapters were the least with the gain formula. What about toric ions? Just one slide I have made in this. Mild to moderate keratoconus works very well. In non-progressive disease, make sure the patient 
that are not dependent on RGP lenses for good, uh, achieving good visual acuity because they, you can never match it and they are used to wearing this contact lenses, they will wear it after surgery also. So no point in putting a toric lens for that. So, uh, the, uh, and it will uncover the toricity of the, of the lens, uh, of the IOL in case they are putting a RGP lens on top. Also, there should be a good history of corrected vision uh, with spectacles only and uh, there should not be a high regular astigmatism. Just uh, this one chart to sum it up, and so if what they have advised is what I have just said, that we should see the repeatable biometric measurements, and in case of uh, severe keratomas, in this case more than 55 diapters, uh, <coughs> you need to of course place a spherical or mono and bone focal IOL, and do not place a toric lens, and we can consider using a standard K value for IOL calculation, the target of of low biopia, right? Because we are already correct, correcting by using the lesser K reading. So you can't use that K formula of minus 3 diapters of predicted uh, refraction. You can't use that material. And of course, we have to pay attention to the axilla. Many of these patients are myopes. And if it's right to white, uh, also all the patients should be uh, taken care of. So my to moderate character is we are reasonably okay with it. In the end, just a few surgical tips because the surgery can differ. There can be a lot of distortions of the eye. Like some of these eyes can have re fees. So it becomes challenging and we should preferably have a standard temporal cornea in the course. The thin cornea, in case of globus, you are going to have a problem. Don't be scared of suturing. Counsel the patient before and that I might be putting in a suture in case I am not able to see the bones. You can use a modified sterile incision also. And also, um, you can put viscoelastic on top repeatedly to have a better kind of visualization and have a focus on the capsular surface to avoid distortions. So, uh, take home message right now. Uh, and if you do have the inclination, try to use the gain formula. That would be probably the, the best, more and most accurate. It has been shown to have the minimum uh, main prediction error in a large series of patients, which was published in ophthalmology. And, uh, but due to um, scarcity, of the literature for your bar section. <coughs> the counsel counseling is very, very important in these patients that anything might happen. And then, but uh, ultimately, I, my experience is that these patients with catacombs are very, very happy after surgery. And uh, many practices, they say that put in an intrastromal corneal ring uh, in patients who have a uh, irregular astigmatism. I don't know what is the experience of the panel here uh, with putting uh, of the uh, intax before keratoconus, Dr. Sopna, I don't know that. Would you do it specifically for cataract surgery? We do put in tags, but not with the aim of this, this patient is to undergo cataract surgery. Let me uh, put in uh, an index. Interesting thought, but but there is a space. Uh, uh,